Hi, good afternoon. This is Greg Lois. I'm the managing partner of the Lois Law Firm. Uh, we are 25 attorneys defending workers' compensation cases in New York and New Jersey. Uh, if you're joining me here today, it's to talk about a topic that has come up many times with me and my clients in the last few years. And in the last year, I've had a bunch of interesting questions about going and coming. When is the employment accident compensable and when is it not? And uh, this is a completely live webinar. Uh, thanks for joining me. I see that we have a lot of attendees in now. Uh, please feel free to uh, send your questions in as we go. I'll try to answer as many of your questions as I can at the end of the webinar. And you don't have to be limited to just this topic, although let's try to keep it as topical as we can. It keeps it more fun. So we're going to be talking about uh, controverting or disputing cases based on the argument that it did not arise out of and in the course of employment. And one context this comes up in all the time is commuting injuries, parking lot injuries, root uh, sales representatives or root sales people who are out and about, travel injuries for work. And when exactly does the employer's liability begin? Uh, when is your employee deemed to be in the course and scope of your employment? So that's what we're going to talk about today. This is a fun topic. I'm hoping there are some fun and interesting questions. And I'm going to talk about some of the really New York City specific uh, things on this topic. For example, uh, the gray area or the sidewalk rules in New York. All right. So let's dive in there today. First of all, let's remember that this is workers' compensation, not employers' compensation. Unless we defend a case and dispute a case, the injury will be deemed compensable. So it's up to us to raise these defenses when we can. Uh, in New York, you must affirmatively raise every defense or you have now waived that defense. So we need to be very thoughtful. Did this injury arise out of and in the course of the employment or was this just a regular commuting injury? Uh, in New York, a denial must be filed by the carrier or employer on a specific form called the FROI-04. And then we, the attorneys, follow up by immediately uh, providing all the backup documentation, certification of counsel, et cetera. Again, in this jurisdiction, if you do not raise this defense within 25 days of the notice of indexing, this defense is waived. All right, let's talk about uh, this defense in a little bit more detail. I'm going to walk through a couple examples, including the home office example, the traveling employee example, and try to really um, stir up some good questions from those of you in the audience today. All right, so first of all, let's be very clear about this. Your employee's regular commute to and from the workplace, should an accident befall them, uh, it does not result in a compensable accident. Uh, just because it happened on their commute to work uh, or the positional risk of, but for going to work, I wouldn't have been exposed to this risk, that's not enough. And our workers' compensation law does not find those injuries to be compensable. So we're going to dispense with discussing these normal commuting injuries. Uh, as the employer or carrier, we're going to want to characterize uh, the injury as arising during the normal commute. All right. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. One of those exceptions is a paid commute where we're paying somebody uh, hourly for their travel time. Uh, guess what? You just turn that into the incident of the employment. Uh, further, employer provided transportation. So, for example, if they're using a company vehicle to travel to and from work, uh, that may then transform that travel to a compensable event, that regular commute. Of course, they're going to have to look into that very specifically to say, were they required or mandated to use that employer-provided transportation? Commuting benefits, so for example, tax benefits offered to employees uh, to encourage them to use public transportation uh, or as a tax-free benefit for employees does not make the commute compensable. Uh, just because you're offering that benefit to your employees does not make it compensable. What about where the employer owns the entire transportation system? Well, there are numerous cases in which New York's transit authorities have not been found to be uh, uh, the employer uh, responsible for injuries when their own employee is using, for example, their subway or bus system to get to and from work. Even where the employer provides them with a uh, free card and says, listen, here's your free ride card. You can go anywhere you want on the bus system because you work for us. Uh, that does not then transform their normal commute to work uh, into an incident of the employment, even when they're wearing their uh, uniform. So that's one of those interesting exceptions to the paid travel time situation. All right. In New York, there is a heck of a lot of sidewalk. Uh, a lot of people's commute 
ends with a short walk uh, from public transportation into the employer's uh, place of uh, employment. In general, Injuries that occur on public streets or on public sidewalks uh, that do not expose the employee to any special hazard are not compensable. However, there is case law in New Jersey uh, that says, I'm sorry, in New York, the Husted decisions, particularly from 1976 plus progeny, there's other cases that follow it, including uh, cases followed by the board as recently as the last several months, that note uh, two exceptions to that. Uh, and they give us a two-part test where they say, you know, the sidewalk may be a gray area that merges into the place of employment. And this is where uh, that sidewalk or that adjoining premises uh, has a very special hazard not shared with the public. So this is where we're asking the employee, you've got to use this specific sidewalk or this specific alley, for example, or this specific entryway to come onto or leave our premises. And it has to be one that's not just a uh, public sidewalk uh, adjoining our building. In other words, we're looking at a sidewalk that's literally directly outside of our door, uh, someplace where we know our employees are going to have to be on it. The sidewalk also has to have some sort of special hazard, uh, merely uneven payment or just, uh, you know, some spilled uh, groceries or something on. It's not going to be enough. It needs to be something more significant than that. And next, there has to be this close association between the sidewalk and the employer's premises. In other words, really a one-way, one-way off situation uh, plus that special hazard. Those are the only circumstances where that injury on the public sidewalk are going to be found compensable. You're not going to find a ton of case law on this, but there is some good case law that still stands. It's on the books. Uh, that has been cited approvingly, particularly by the board in board panel level decisions over the last several years. Uh, I get a lot of questions about sidewalks and uh, really, uh, particularly circumstances where uh, claimants are not on our sidewalk. You know, they've, they've gone down to get their uh, lunch down the block. They're walking down the street. They slip and fall on a sidewalk. They say it's a special hazard because the sidewalk is perhaps uneven. Uh, nope, that's not going to cut the mustard. Uh, in addition on sidewalks, this is just interesting uh, stuff about New York's uh, general rule, uh, sidewalks, in order for the hazard to be considered special, uh, there has to be something more than a de minimis defect. Uh, and there's no specific, uh, some jurisdictions say an inch separation is enough. New York doesn't have that. It just keeps saying it has to be um, uh, you know, beyond standard or extraordinary in order for a sidewalk defect to be compensable in the general liability world. All right, so that's a little information about sidewalks. It comes down, unfortunately, to a very case-by-case -case sort of review or test where we're saying, well, was there another way in and out of the employment? How close was the sidewalk injury to the location? And was there kind of a special hazard? Uh, for example, there is case law in New York that says the, the grates over subways, um, uh, getting your heel caught in that subway grate, uh, perhaps a female employee wearing high heels, uh, that has been deemed to be a special hazard. All right, what about employees who go to multiple locations during the course of the day or course of the work week? So I'm really thinking about here as someone who has a, a sales route or perhaps a customer experience manager who's going from location to location, premises to premises. So I'm thinking about employers with multiple locations or we're gonna go visit clients in specific locations. Um, now, if the employee has a specific place, they start their day. So every Monday, I'm always starting off on premises A. Every Tuesday, I start my day at premises B. That commute from their home to premises A or premises B, wherever that commute is expected to start, that's considered a regular commute. Uh, even though the employee uh, reports to different locations from day to day, if it's the same location on a specific day, we're gonna say, hey, wait a second, that's their regular place of employment on Mondays. That's their regular place of employment on Tuesdays. Therefore, that initial tr um, travel from their home to that first place of employment should be considered their regular commute. Once they're starting to go from pr uh, premises to premises, all of that travel in between we expect would be found to be compensable or uh, covered under workers' compensation. Um, generally, uh, the fact that the employee goes from to one specific premises a day and then a different one the next day does not make that more than a commute. And that's typically where we see these questions arise. Well, it, how frequently are they visiting these locations? Uh, is it regular? Can we prove that in court? Can I go into court and show a pattern of this person following the same five stops at the same five days in a row over and over and over again? All right. Uh, again, this is a reminder. This is a completely live presentation. 
please ask me your questions. Uh, that makes it so much more interesting and entertaining to answer live questions. And I'm going to do that at the end. Uh, just in case you're wondering, we're almost to the end, so start putting your questions in now. All right, what about parking lots? So parking lot injuries are a classic uh, situation. I get questions about parking lot injuries all the time. In order to determine if a parking lot injury is compensable, we're going to have to know who owned the parking lot, who maintained the parking lot, and if the employer neither owns nor maintains the parking lot, who is requiring the employees to park in that spot? If they are not required to park in a specific lot and the employer does not own or maintain the lot, generally speaking, parking lot slip and falls are not going to be found to be compensable. And that's important. So when you call up uh, your defense attorney and you say, hello, I got this case, I had an involved you know, fall in a parking lot, pretty much we're all going to ask you the same questions. Who owned it? Who maintained it? And who required or directed them to park in that lot? Many times my retail employees will say, hey, Greg, uh, we don't tell them uh, that they have to park in the lot, but we tell them that when they do park in the lot, they have to park way in the back of the lot so that our employees, uh, I'm sorry, so that our customers can get these nicer spaces that are closer to the building. Guess what? Even though you don't own that parking lot, even though you don't maintain that parking lot, you told the employees where they should park within the lot, you've now made all of that walking trip through the parking lot all the way into your business compensable. All right, what about travel time injuries? And really I'm talking about situations where uh, employees are going to visit clients, going to visit customers. We're really talking about regular business uh, travel, uh, things like conferences, events, that type of thing. That uh, travel is pretty much portal to portal coverage. The only exception to that portal to portal coverage is going to be when the employee is clearly deviating and participating in something that's purely personal. Uh, so for example, uh, they're in their hotel room, they're taking a shower, they have a slip and fall in the shower. Probably not compensable even though they're staying in that hotel because we told them you've got to go to this event or conference. Not compensable because there's nothing extraordinary or employer specific and they would have been taking that shower at home either way. So uh, there are exceptions to that portal to portal travel time coverage for our employees who are attending off campus, off site, off premises type of events. Uh, how about personal or special errands? I know uh, people in my office love to send their assistants across the street to go to Starbucks and pick us up our Starbucks and bring it back. Are they transforming that uh, simple walk across the street to get Starbucks into an incident of the employment? Well, there's no real bright line test, uh, but generally speaking, if it's required or mandated or facilitated, generally speaking, we're going to be found compensable. Now, I recently defended a case, actually my partner, Tashia Razul, defended a case in which a law firm uh, had a claim brought against it by one of its own legal assistants who was going across the street to Dunkin' Donuts to obtain coffee uh, for herself. It turned out that nobody told her to do that. She wasn't um, you know, getting permission to do that. She was just getting up from her desk and going across the street. She slipped and fell on the sidewalk in front of the Dunkin' Donuts, and that was found to be not compensable. All right, how about working from home injuries? I think we're going to see more and more of these. Uh, in New Jersey, there's a seminal case in which a AT&T worker sustained a heart attack at home and then claimed that the heart attack was due to working from home and therefore compensable. Injuries that occur in the home workplace environment, even though they're off-premises, if the employee is required or mandated to work from home, will be found compensable. We just transformed their house into the, uh, the place of employment. However, if they're working from home and get injured in a slip and fall while walking their dog, those cases should be controverted or denied because they're not actually engaging in activities uh, that further the employment uh, interest of the employer. We're seeing more and more working from home injuries. Uh, and I want to distinguish an entire class of cases in which the employee has simply taken work home, a claim to be working from home, uh, or they're going to intend to work from home. A great example is someone who has work materials in their car at the time they have a car accident on their way home from work. And our argument is this is a regular commute. You would have been going home whether or not you had work materials in your car. Uh, simply having work materials with you at the time you sustained your off-premises injury does not transform that into an incident of the employment. So those cases should be denied and disputed. All right, well, we made it through sort of the prefatory material. I'm hoping there's a lot of good questions in here. If you haven't typed your question in yet, please type it in now. I'm really looking forward to seeing some good questions today. So. Uh, let's let's start at the top. I'm going to go in order. I never say the person's last name. I'll just say your first name and read the question. I'm doing this live, so if I think the question's either not appropriate or can't answer it in this format, I'll let you know and move on to the next one. 
Kathleen asked the question, once an employee leaves the sidewalk and enters the building and falls in the vestibule, before they reach the bank of elevators, would it be compensable? Yeah, more li most likely. Uh, if there is a specific ingress and egress, even though the uh, gen it's in the general area uh, the, of the building, it's not specifically the employer's area, but it's a location that they have to travel to or through to get to the employer location. In other words, it really is part of the employment because it's the only way in safely in and out of the location. It's probably going to be found compensable. I, you know, but by the way, Kathleen, I would probably deny that case depending on the facts of the case. Uh, I would probably deny that one, particularly just to give us enough time to investigate and perhaps uh, uh, put together a Section 32 defense. Mark asked the question, if I normally go to my office day to day, but on one day I have to go to a client instead, does compensability begin when I leave my door? The answer is yes. So generally speaking, uh, when you're on your way from home to a non-standard work location, and that could be uh, a client or customer, that could be visiting uh, one of the premises of your employer, uh, doesn't really matter. That's going to be uh, probably a compensable event, Mark. Uh, next, uh, let's see, Jill asked the question. Uh, in this scenario, compensable in New York, parking lot not owned nor maintained by the employer and the employee is not required to park there, but the employee slips and falls in the parking lot while going back to car to retrieve work-related paperwork employee left in the car. All right, Jill, I know this sounds crazy, but I have a whole pile of these. We've seen this many, many times. This is where the employee uh, leaves work, uh, takes a little break, uh, goes outside, smokes a cigarette, but uh, they're in the parking lot. Really not my premises, but it's a paid break. Yep, probably compensable. Two, sent by the employment to go to the car to go collect something related to the employment. Yep, probably compensable. Uh, if they're expected to be at work and working and are going to get something work-related out of the car, probably compensable. Now, let me give you a contrafactual. Uh, cases where the employee is not scheduled to work, but is coming to work, for example, to pick up a paycheck or drop something off for work, uh, and slips and falls in the parking lot, that's generally not going to be found to be compensable. So in this case, I would really talk to the employer and say, hey, what's going on here? Uh, do we think this was something related, not completely unrelated to the employment, who that they just claimed they're getting some kind of employment paperwork out of the car or not to try to transform it into some incident in the employment or not? But that's really the analysis we'd go through. Okay. Kathleen asked the question, if a home care nurse does not go to the same patient's home each day, when they leave their house, does not get paid until they get to the first house, oh, scroll down, scroll, scroll, uh, they, but, but they do not get paid until they get to the first house, is that covered? No, generally not, if they're going to the same patients on a regular schedule, right? That's the situation where it's like visiting uh, a, a, a client route or a sales route where every Monday I go to patient A, every Tuesday I go to patient B. You're not getting paid for the travel time. You're not using my transportation, meaning my vehicle. And it's really a very regular schedule. It's going to come down to how regular that schedule is. If we can say, hey, look, they always go to visit patient A on Monday mornings, that trip from their home to patient A, which, by the way, is unpaid, is really just their regular commute to their first workplace. The next one they go to, from patient A to patient B on the same day, that is going to be compensable. All right. Uh, Christopher asked a question. This is going to be a good one because it involves cocktails. Uh, says, uh, I scrolled up. Christopher says, an employee is at a conference out of town with their supervisor and manager. The employer, after the employee, after partaking in cocktail hour at the conference, goes out to dinner with their supervisor and manager. While walking to dinner, they trip and fall. Is that covered under workers' comp? Almost never. All right. So unless they were required to go out to dinner, it is going to be unlikely that would be found compensable. Uh, I would argue that that is simply, uh, you know, we're going to go eat. It's personal care. You're going to have to go eat or, uh, no matter what. And it's really going to come down to how compelled or how mandatory that employee felt that dinner with their supervisor and manager really was. There is case law in New York on this where employees imbibe, have a bunch of drinks, they're at a conference, and they go from location to location, drinking from location to location. Uh, first, the employer raised intoxication as a defense, and then later said this has got nothing to do with the employment. It's pure deviation, pure personal errand. Uh, it was the deviation and personal errand arguments that held the day in that case. All right. Uh, hi, Greg. 
person lives in New Jersey and works in New York City? This question comes from, scroll, 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 John. Person lives in New Jersey and works in New York City. Set office location in New York City. Part of the job is visiting clients in New York City. When visiting a client and then leaving to go home, she falls on the train. Is this compensable? Or is the train ride home considered a standard commute? Thanks. All right, so that's a really tough one because what we're saying is they did do a special mission, which was to visit a client that was off premises, and then we're gonna travel directly home in the most direct route. I do think that would be compensable. Even though they gotta go home no matter what, once you take the employee and send them to a different location, a non-standard location, uh, not the employer's premises, then that trip home is probably gonna be compensable. Uh, Julie asked the question, if the work vehicle is owned by the employer and the employee is on his or her way home, would that be compensable? Right, so generally speaking, we deny those. Uh, simply using employer-provided transportation is not enough to make the entire trip compensable. It, we will still make the argument that that was a regular commute. All right, uh, let me see how much time we have. It's 1220, and it's the last question we have was from Julie. If you have other questions and I just didn't get to them, or... Uh, you've got a question that's more complicated and you want us to answer it uh, live, please feel free to call me, please give me a ring, and we'll absolutely answer your question. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, please come next month. Our next topic is going to be, should I pay temp? We're going to look at all of the defenses to paying temporary disability benefits uh, and what the rules are surrounding that and some recent case law. Uh, of course, that is always the third Monday of the month. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. I hope you have a great week.